I'm sorry, so can you uh, say that again, uh, Dr. Hale, about the actual purpose of taxes? The actual purpose of taxes is to limit inflation. Um, the barrier that the US faced is not, US faces is not a barrier of government solvency. That's the case in any monetary sovereign, for any monetary so sovereign government, in any monetary sovereign economy, as, as I'll explain in a moment. I still haven't explained what a mon monetary sovereign government is, but the US government cannot run out of dollars. Government solvency is not the issue. The US can run out of things for the government and for people to buy. There's a limit to the productive capacity of the US economy. If you try and go beyond that limit, there will be inflation. So it's necessary for there to be taxes in order to create room within the productive capacity of the US economy for the government to spend without there being too much spending in total. If you want to put it brutally, taxes destroy some of the ability of the private sector to spend, to create more space for the government to spend without there being inflation. But that doesn't mean that the level of taxes and the level of government spending have to be the same. They are not normally the same. The US government historically has nearly always run deficits in the past, and it will, regardless of who the president is and regardless of who controls Congress, it will nearly always run deficit in the, deficits in the future as well. That's because over time, the private sector, and in the case of the US, the rest of the world too, wants to save US dollars. Now, for you to save, you have to spend less than you earn. That means someone else or some institution has to spend more than it earns. Someone has to deficit spend. The best placed institution to do that in the US is the US federal government because the federal government is the only institution which cannot run out of money. You can run out of things to buy, you can't run out of US dollars if you're the US government. That's an important point. It means if there is a major slump, like there was in 2009, then, well, that means at the moment there's not enough spending going on in the economy for the economy to be at or near full employment. So you could say that creates the, it creates the conditions where it would make sense for the government to run a much larger fiscal deficit than before. They could, back in 2009, have bailed out a lot of people who were losing their homes and losing their jobs without, at the time, creating inflation. They could have prevented the recession being so severe. Um, there are lots of other things we can say too, but basically anything that's technically possible in the US can be paid for. That's to put it in a nutshell. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, uh, this final question here, and thank you for how informative this has been. Uh, Dr. Hale, when and how and how severe is this next? Every, everything I'm reading says there's going to be another recession. They've, they haven't regulated anything with the banks here in the States since the last one. So what do you see coming? Uh, I don't see in the immediate future a financial crisis as severe as that that hit in uh, 2009. Um, private debt is rising again in the US. It's not nearly as high as it was at that time. Um, the, you don't have the same problems in the property market you had at that time. Uh, I, I, I do think there is a, a potential for a global recession at the moment with some of the initial causes of that coming from outside the US. But if you were to ask me what I think is likely to be the trigger of the next major global economic crisis, I think it might be an ecological trigger, the next oh, one. I see. Sometime in the early 2020s, because I think sometime in the early 2020s, people are going to realize, even people like Donald Trump, are going to realize that we are faced with a massive um, crisis and one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenge that our species has ever faced. And do you think it'll be when, like I remember reading about the governor of the Bank of England uh, gave a speech, I think three years ago, warning about the, as he called it, the carbon bubble, when uh, fossil fuel investors realize there's no longevity, that they're going to pull all their money out at the same time. Is that what you're talking about? People will all sort of realize that at the same time and the, the, the global economy of, of oil will collapse the economy 
Well, it's, it, there's bound to be uh, major disruptions. At the moment, um, when you read even the most optimistic discussions about what's going to happen to uh, uh, en global energy supply uh, around the world, they're talking about the proportion of electricity generated through coal, which is the dirtiest fuel of, fuel of all, uh, falling from about 30% to maybe uh, in the 2030s to about 20% if we're lucky. Now, what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is saying is that by the end of the 2030s, if we're going to avoid a really severe climate change, the proportion of electricity generation from coal has to be virtually zero. Right. So nobody at the moment is facing up to the challenge. Governments are not going to meet the commitments that they made uh, in Paris, but even those commitments in Paris are woefully inadequate. So you're right uh, in terms of uh, uh, companies uh, engaged in coal mining, for example, their assets are going to be entirely stranded at some point. Uh, they're basically just going to be banned from digging up any more coal. And we're going to face a challenge. And that challenge is that at the moment, really, technologically, we don't have a way of replacing fossil fuels in our energy system. We're not rapidly enough developing renewables and technologically, it, the way we are at the moment, may not even be possible to develop them rapidly enough. So we need a government in power, especially in the US, because without US leadership, this really isn't going to happen at all. We need a government in power by the early 2020s at the latest that understands macroeconomics, understands modern monetary theory, understands the fiscal space which it has and uses that fiscal space, yes, to shift US energy production away from fossil fuels and especially away from coal and towards renewables. But more than that, we need a massive research effort to plug the gap. Uh, and at the moment, the idea that you might want to cut back on relevant scientific research in these areas because you're worried about the government deficit being bigger than you think it ought to be. Actually, the, the government budget balance taken out of context of the economy as a whole and issues like inflation um, uh, is meaningless. Right. The deficit is only a problem in the US if inflation is beginning to go out of control, that's when you need to raise taxes or, or cut spending. At the moment, there is the US has, uh, despite the fact that your official unemployment rate is low at the moment, inflation in the US is low and everybody expects it to remain quite low in the, in, in the short term. There is fiscal space in the US to deal with some of these issues, to start taking these issues seriously. More generally, later on, you need people that are in charge of macroeconomic policy, in charge of the government budget, who understand modern monetary theory. Um, because we've got major challenges to meet and having people in charge who basically believe in a, a fictitious view of the role of the government in the economy and who, who buy into the misleading, completely misleading metaphor of the government as a household. The notion that the government has to tighten its belt, that if the government borrows too much, it will uh, end up being insolvent. Um, if you're a monetary sovereign government, and let me just come back to what a monetary sovereign government is in a moment, because I haven't yet. If you're a monetary sovereign government, that sort of logic doesn't apply to you. You're in a completely different position. It gives you more space. It gives you more ability to deal with some of the real challenges. That's the point. We're focusing on things that don't matter, like, the size of the so-called US national debt, uh, uh, which is the word debt shouldn't really apply to it. And it certainly isn't a national debt either. Um, and, and people are focusing on the US fiscal deficit as though that's the important thing. It's not the important thing. It's these other issues that are important and that we need to be um, focusing on. Now, could I just go back and talk about what's necessary to be a monetary sovereign government? Yeah. Please. Not every government is a monetary sovereign government, and this misleads people too. You get people, I've seen people in the US saying, if we go on like this, we're going to turn into Greece, or absurd things like that. You are a monetary sovereign government if you have your own currency, first of all. Secondly, that currency should have a floating exchange rate. You should have no fixed 
target value for your currency against any foreign currency, or for that matter, against any commodity. If the US was to go back on the gold standard, it would be voluntarily giving up its monetary sovereignty. That wouldn't be a good idea. Um, you should also avoid having significant amounts of foreign currency denominated debt. Otherwise, you can get into trouble. You could be like Argentina. Argentina, the, Argent the government of Argentina has a lot of US dollar debt. If you have a lot of US dollar debt, then particularly if your currency depreciates against the US dollar, it makes it very difficult for you to service that debt, to pay interest on that debt over time, because you owe something you can run out of. Argentina can't print US dollars. So you need to avoid foreign currency denominated debt. In some low income countries cases, their monetary sovereignty is also limited by the fact that they're dependent on imported necessities like oil, or foodstuffs which are priced in foreign currency in US dollars because again if their currencies depreciate against the US dollar it can increase the cost of living of the poorest people mm -hmm. because the price of basic necessities in domestic currencies go up and that causes problems none of those things apply to the US none of those things apply in Australia none of those things apply in a variety of other countries like Japan or for that matter the United Kingdom all of those countries are monetary sovereigns. And so what I was saying earlier about uh, government spending and about the role of taxation and about the government budget applies to all of them. It doesn't just apply to the US. In other words, it applies to monetary sovereign governments in general. All right. Well, Dr. Hale, this has been uh, extremely informative and I appreciate you shedding light on all this and the history and also showing where potentially the economic collapse will come. And also too, from an economic standpoint, the severity with which the environment plays into this. Like I, I, I talk about this a lot, that if we don't address, they say, if we don't do, take drastic measures like now, by 2030, it'll be too late to reverse any of the climate change that's happening. Absolutely. I, I agree with you entirely about, about that. Um, we do have some modern monetary theorists who are specialist ecological economists, including a, a good friend of mine called Phil Lawn, who at the moment is developing uh, an indicator called the Genuine Progress Indicator, which is an alternative, much better measure of economic progress and welfare than gross domestic product, which takes these things into, into, into account. But it's most important, and this is my message to Americans really, you have to elect the right president next time. And the right president cannot be a Republican and cannot be an establishment Democrat either. Yeah, that's because absolutely Because it's true. going to be too late. If you don't get this right soon, it's going to be too late. And if it's too late for the US, it's actually too late for the whole world. That's absolutely true. I, I've said this before, and it's why I, I, when, I, when people tell me, oh, we just got to get any Democrat in there, I'm like, no. The corporate Democrats have helped create this problem, and they, uh, we don't have the time. We don't, we don't have the time to, to waste here on this sort of uh, incremental centrism and kicking this uh, political football back and forth. Like, things need to happen uh, immediately. Well, I'm not, going to, I'm not saying it has to be Bernie Sanders. Um, uh, but someone like but that. Someone like that. I, I had the chance to meet his brother um, when I was doing a talk in Oxford in, in, in the UK a couple of months ago. And his brother must be sick of people saying this. But I, uh, over, over dinner, I basically was saying, you need to tell your brother to look after his health. Because, yeah, it needs to be someone like that. And at the moment, obviously, I haven't been following US politics as closely as, as, as you would have done, but I haven't seen that many candidates that are like that. Well, the there are. It's just they won't get the backing of the big democratic machine. I mean, they're, they're just more people that are, uh, you know, they're pro-banking and they'll, they'll give some lip service to no corporate money. In, in The great thing with Bernie is not just his attitude, it's his charisma. Yeah, you need, you need that as well because you have to break your right. You've got to defeat all these corporate interests, and uh, and he came close to it. Yeah, and they last cheated. Time. <laughs> they, well, maybe they did, but uh, I'm hopeful that next time it will be different. Whether it's him or whether it's somebody like him, and we could begin to turn these things around. And the initial starting point. 
Well, I just people often say that the starting point of the the move towards neoliberalism was the uh, revolution in Chile in 1973, and everything else started from from then on, really. And that led to Thatcherism and Reagan and everything else. Well, I think that the next U.S. presidential election might be, if 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 only um, you could get a, a the sort of result we'd like. Um, it could potentially for the world be one of those turning points I think where we've gone to the brink and then we start turning back again. Well, we have to because America yeah. used to lead the world. I mean, we, that's what it we still need. does lead the world. It's just leading the world in the wrong direction. Yeah, it's leading the world in war and uh, mm. corruption and all this other stuff. It needs to go back to leading the world. I mean, America has the, the, the money to put like a Green New Deal, as they call it, as the Green Party talks about, and what, you know, the way FDR did after the Depression and then the threat of Hitler got the whole country to work and the whole country could go to work. And as you say, in researching, because green energy is a technology. Mm. It's, so it's, it's the more money you put into green energy, uh, like any piece of technology, it gets smaller, cheaper, and faster but you mm. put research behind it. So if America did that, it could absolutely, um, every American could be put to work putting solar panels and wind turbines all over the world. I mean, China made the decision to go to wind and they all of a sudden in 2015 spent $111 billion on wind. They just did it. Well, maybe they did. They are still the biggest carbon emitter in the world at the moment. Yeah. The only ones that are a bigger emitter than the, than the US. That's the scale of the challenge things are moving in the right direction, they're moving too, too slowly in the right direction. I think a good, a good starting point for the world would be to get the macroeconomics right, and then we can deal with all these other issues. And to get the macroeconomics right, I'd like Treasury Secretary Stephanie Kelton, uh, and I would like the Chairman of the Federal Reserve to be Warren Mosler. That's well, what that's, I'd like to see. That's good to know. And if uh, the President is Tulsi Gabbard, and, and then we have a shot. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of hers. Yeah, she's, mm. she's pretty fantastic. And she's yeah. introducing all kinds of uh, bills and stuff like that. And she's just facing the military industrial complex. Because when she says, why are we attacking Syria, she's called an Assad apologist. So that's like what she's up against. But well, I, I'm hopeful for the future. I'm naturally an optimist. Uh, so I'm hopeful. Uh, I, I think my wife never watches this, otherwise she'd laugh when I said I'm naturally an optimist. But on these kind of issues, I'm naturally an optimist. Um, and really, I, I think that we can turn these things around. We can deliver equitable full employment. We can give everybody a decent quality of life without destroying our natural environment. It is technically possible, or it's going to be technologically possible to do these things. Why is it important for everybody to understand modern monetary theory? Because our economy is and will remain a monetary economy. And uh, um, we need people in charge who are aware of how the monetary system works and can use it for the public purpose. And for that to happen, we need the general population, everybody, to have some degree of literacy, to understand the basics. And the most important thing to understand is the difference between a currency issuer and a currency user. You and I are currency users. If we're going to spend, well, we have to, we have to have some income to spend out of. So we have to earn money before we spend it or we can borrow and spend, but then we need income in the future to pay back that debt. And potentially if we're in, are not in a position to do that, we can become insolvent, we can go bankrupt. That's true of us. It's even true of state governments in the US. Mm -hmm. it's, it's certainly true of businesses, but it's not true of the US federal government. The US federal government is a currency issuer that puts them in a completely different position to everybody else. It is quite possible and indeed probably a good idea for the US government to run a deficit every year forever. They're not going to run out of money. And as far, the last thing maybe that I ought to just make sure that I'm clear on, I've, I've used the term national debt. People talk about the size of the US national debt. Now, most of the US national debt is owned directly or indirectly by US residents. So it's obviously, obviously not a national debt because you own it. It's actually your savings. 
people talk about the cost of paying interest on the national debt. First of all, the US government chooses to pay interest on, its, on, on the bonds that it issues on the, on, on the national debt. It's providing income for savers who want to hold their savings in the form of very safe assets, which is the financial liabilities of the US government. The US government will never default on those assets. You can't get safer than that. So it's a return on your savings. But secondly, like every other item of spending that the US government does, the interest that's paid on the US national debt is new money. So it's mildly stimulative for the economy. Some of it, of course, yes, is held offshore because, for example, down the years, the Chinese have chosen to export to the uh, US and to earn US dollars and to hold on to those US dollars. They've then chosen to buy some US government securities with those US dollars because that's been the safest way of holding those US dollars. The US government is in no sense dependent on the Chinese government to do that. The US government spending those dollars into existence funds the ability of savers, including the Chinese, to build up their savings in US dollars. But the US government does not need the Chinese government or anybody else to want to lend to it before it can spend. It doesn't even need to borrow at all. It issues government securities because they play a useful role in your financial system. They help the Federal Reserve manage interest rates and they provide income to, well, people that have got money in pension funds that are saving up for their retirement. Now, these things are not generally understood. If, if the rest of the world doesn't want to buy US government securities anymore, the US government could just not issue them. It wouldn't be a problem. It wouldn't stop the US government spending. And indeed, in my more uh, whimsical moments, uh, I, I'd like to echo Warren Mosley here and say, you know, if you really want to, you can pay back the entire US national debt tomorrow. It's not a problem. Uh, US government bonds are just effectively transferable term deposits or savings accounts held at the Federal Reserve. Uh, all you'd be doing if you paid back the US national debt tomorrow is you'd be just converting those to transaction accounts at the Federal Reserve. That could be done with a flick of a switch or it could be done just by typing it into a computer. Uh, it, it, if you don't understand that, you don't understand government finances and you're not really qualified to discuss US fiscal policy. Now, unfortunately, the great majority of people in Washington, DC, literally don't understand that. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's far more that they don't understand, but... Uh, I, uh... Well, that's, quite, that's kind of important. And that's why we need people like uh, Warren and Stephanie <laughs> and uh, Randall Ray, and Pavlina Cheneva, and Scott Fulweiler, and Fadel Kaboob, and I could go through a long list of brilliant American modern monetary theorists. Uh, these people need to become more prominent over well, time. It, yeah. What we're trying to do on this show is, is uh, I do have an interview set up with Fidel, and so I appreciate your time, Dr. Hale, and that's what we're trying to do on this show, mm. is to wake people up to the realities of what are going on. And then You're doing a great job. Well, thanks, man. <laughs> I just yeah. basically asked a handful of questions and I listened. Um, yeah. But uh, thank you so much. And uh, to everybody watching out there, the uh, link to the Bill the Billy blog, is that correct? Again, make sure. That's I right. Yeah. Okay. That's in the show notes below. Thank you for watching. And uh, we'll have more great interviews like this coming up on the Political Vigilante.